All right, guys, it's finally time. We need to talk about, is the Mark IV Super going to be worth anything with the new Mark V Super coming out? Are these things really going to plummet? Are they going to skyrocket? Let's today, let's discuss what my feelings are on the car, where I think the market's gonna go, what I can show you guys the differences, uh, and kind of show you why I feel the Mark IV Super is going to hold its value. First up here, guys, I apologize if there's any echo or anything. I'm trying to get a little bit better. I've got a new mic on this, so it should help, and I'm closer to the camera. Uh, if you've watched my previous videos, thank you very much. If you are new to the channel, please do me a big favor. Give this a good subscribe, and if you could, give it a big thumbs up. Uh, it helps out the channel. It helps me out, and uh, it forces them to push the videos towards you because I know you like my content if you're watching this video. So getting directly into this, is the Mark IV Supra going to be worth anything now that the Mark V Supra is coming out? So let's sit down and start with specs and kind of start with where and why the Supra is so special in itself. So first and foremost here, let's, let's, let's just talk about the elephant in the room, obviously Fast and Furious, you know, that, that helped jettison the car. Is that the only reason? No. Anyone that says it like, oh, it's because of Fast and Furious, absolutely not. Guys were building these cars and starting to make serious power before this. Um, we had companies out there making big power. Powerhouse Racing was around making good power kits and stuff for this, for turbo kits, you had Goretti. Et cetera, et cetera. Um, there was multiple companies making a lot more power with these cars and people realized it wasn't just Fast and the Furious that did this, you know. That car wasn't chosen for that movie just because randomly, it was chosen for a reason. It, the car was a badass car, just like the RX-7 was. Uh, that's why Dom's car in that is also well known. Now the Rotaries had their own issues, but back in the day, Rotary was king, but eh, that's another story for another time. I'll explain that to you why Rotaries were the best of the best back in the late uh, late 90s and early 90s, that's where they were king. But anyways, I digress. Um, the whole reason here, I feel that the Super is still gonna hold its value because it's its own entity. What I mean by that is, let's look at the R34 Skyline and R35. They actually have a very small gap in their time, but the R34 is worth this erroneous amount of money. They are worth so much money, and not just here in the US, everywhere, even in Japan. You know, used models going over in Japan, $55,000, $60,000 for non-V specs, um, which is a good bit of money considering what they cost brand new. These cars now have miles on them. Uh, now, once they get here to the States, especially here, once the 25 year rule comes up, which I believe would be 2023 or 2024, 2024, because 1999 was for the first model. Um, those cars are gonna be worth a ton of money because they're their own special car. They had their own little niche. They had that special time and place with the 90s styling, the way the cars drove, the way they acted. It's just a different animal. Um, the R35 is a great car, but it's its own car. It's its own thing. Yes, it's the GTR. Yes, it's the same thing, but it, it was different. And that's how I feel the new Super is versus this old Super, my Mark IV. Um, the Mark IV had its own special place in time. Uh, it's known to be well overbuilt. The 2JZ, which they've done test after test, is probably one of the best engines to be ever built, no matter if you're into Japanese, American, European. The blocks, the internals, the head, everything about it was overbuilt to another degree. If you watch Moto DVD, he's kind of gone over this in detail, and pretty much showing that, like, as much as they don't want to admit it, as much as they're RB guys, the 2JZ, everything about it, it's lighter, it's stronger, Siamese bore, everything about it is just way better. I'm actually going to link that video down below for you guys to go check that out. It does a great comparison. Uh, the guys over at Moto DVD and Plasma Racing did a fantastic job with that. Um, so that's part of it, what I feel this is, but it also comes down to a couple other things. One of the biggest things, and most people recognize here, is the 2JZ that's in the car. Now, currently mine is missing the turbo side of it right now. I have a new turbo kit coming for it, so please uh, ignore that. Uh, I've got a whole new kit. That's why it has no front mount either right now. I've got all new parts coming for the car. But this motor right here is what makes this car so iconic. Now, what's funny about it is, kind of like the new Supra, this motor comes in a multitude of Toyota cars. It came in like seven different vehicles, which is great. That's why there's such a plethora of them. But they were overbuilt. This is, these motors were built during the time when Toyota was so cash rich and Japan was making so much money, they could spend so much time in R&D, it was unreal. So these motors were just, they're to a next level built. Um, now, just a couple things people always screw up. The head is not designed by Yamaha. The 1JZ was, Toyota then revamped the 2JZ, based it off the 1JZ, but the head itself is not designed by Yamaha. It has parts of the 1JZ, which was designed by Yamaha. Same with my MR2 over there. The head on that was also designed by Yamaha, both on the 1JZ and the 3S GTE, as actually a stamp on it says Yamaha on the top where the plastic is and stuff. So, I mean, it's pretty blatant on those. Where these didn't, and they totally even admits that they revamped these. They're not the greatest flowing head in the world, but they work. 
Um, but that being said, this, this motor is very, very stout. You know, even down the intake manifold, and I see guys that do aftermarket ones, the intake manifold flows so well, even up to 1,000 horsepower, they're still super, super efficient. That being said, with the new Mark V being a BMW motor, twin scroll, it is a, it, it's a BMW inside. It doesn't have the heart of Toyota. If you're a Toyota guy, uh, I personally love the new Mark V, but it's not a Toyota. It's not fully Toyota. I know when people don't want to admit it, it's not. It doesn't, it doesn't have that essence about it. Like this was built in Japan. The block was made in Japan. Um, there is some German parts on it. If you talk about the transmission, the get drag, and then the head was actually done by Yamaha, another Japanese company, but not Toyota. So there is things that go a little wonky with it. So that's just some of it. Now let's get down, not just the motor, let's talk about the exterior of the car here. Now, unfortunately guys, I am in Pennsylvania, so it is freezing cold outside right now, so I'm doing this in my garage, uh, but the sleekness of the Mark IV Supra is kind of what makes it iconic also, if you guys can see here. The one thing about this car is, is very sleek, very nice looking in my opinion. Now, when this car came out, and I'll be honest too, for the time, I think it was a little ahead of its time in design wise, so it almost seemed kind of bland. If you look at other cars at the time, it didn't have the aggressiveness the other cars did. This car, if in factory form, let me flip up a picture here for you, is a very blah car. It's nothing you go wow about when you saw it. Besides the big wing in the back, the car was kind of underwhelming when you first see it. Now, driving it was another, you know, it's another animal in itself. But from a design standpoint, I can see why back in the day people weren't too wowed about it. Now, the new Supra it does give you a wow factor in my opinion. If you guys can see here, um, this car, the new Supra, looks phenomenal in my opinion. Again, this is my opinion. Some people don't like it. Um, I love how wide it is. It is actually wider than the Mark IV Supra, but it is actually shorter by four inches. Um, so that kind of makes it look a little stubby. Some people don't like it, but it should handle better because of this. Another thing with the Supra is there's some iconic things about it that everyone knows. One, the wing, but the taillights. Now, the taillights in these were very unique. They were very modernized. Like even to this day, they look like modern taillights, the way they were designed. These are the later model, the 97, 98 style. There was a earlier version, which I'll show you here. Um, they were a black housing where these later ones pushed the housing out more and made them gray to make them a little bit less dark and it modernized the car some. You can see the difference here with my gray taillights for the 97, 98 uh, here in the US, which would have went up to 2002 in Japan. Um, it really helped out. I think it modernized the car a ton. Another thing with the Supra, turbo wasn't actually added to the later models. Uh, technically my car shouldn't, this is an NA chassis that I swapped and I used turbo badges on it, but that actual little turbo guy there wasn't there. Uh, I do like the fact the new Supra has the duck bill like this one has, you guys can't see it. See what's actually there. When the wing's off, you can really problem that the new one made it even more, but it's not quite the same. Now, probably the biggest reason these cars, and most well-known reason, is the cockpit interior. If you guys can see here, like just sitting down, let's go ahead. The cockpit interior of these cars are what makes it so iconic when you're driving it. Now, please excuse my single din head unit here, but you got the cockpit interior, you got the tack dead center, massive right there. Like they don't care about anything else. Everything else is pushed aside. All they care about is that tachometer. You want to see where the car is revving at, which a new super, in my opinion, pretty pretty good homage to. Uh, it's digital now. Obviously, it's 2019. Or it's going to be a 2020 Supra. Um, so it is dead center like this, but it is digital. Uh, I think it looks quite nice, but it doesn't have this jet fighter look. So everything wraps around you. Everything's faced. This is actually, if you're in the car, this is actually tilted towards the driver. If you're in the passenger side, a lot of this you can't directly see, which it's pretty neat. Uh, it's very driver centric. Uh, even the, look at the doors here, look how basic everything about the car is. Like it just, the cars are great, but they are very simplistic. And I can see why back in the day, some people are like, where's the $50,000 in these car? Where, where, where's all that money at? For the the other worst part, there's not a cup holder in these cars. Zero cup holder in them, although I've added one now. Had a th one 3D printed, um, and this was an ashtray because your sports car needs an ashtray, but not a cup holder, apparently. Um, these interiors were pretty freaking awesome. Now, the new Super here, which is flipped up, it doesn't wrap around you. Almost, I mean, you guys can see, it's a BMW interior. It, it is. Let's face it. It's a very BMW interior, uh, down to the iDrive and everything like that is 100%. The controls, everything is BMW, um, but it's unique and it is new. Uh, it is different for the Z5 versus what the Super is going to be. The controls and stuff are slightly different, which I do like that fact. Um, they are modernized for Toyota itself. So 
I personally, I'm not sure how well it's going to age, where this car, it was so bland in the fact that you were able to age the car better because it wasn't so drastic, it wasn't so crazy looking that it's aged so well because of it. And I think that's part of the reason why these cars are holding their value in the fact that they're not these crazy looking like sharp cars and stuff. They're very muted, they're very blah, but I think that's what helped it, you know, age so well over the years. And I think lastly, I think what makes these cars, you know, going to be, hold their value extremely well is the fact that they were such a limited production car. Here in the US, they were priced out of production. What I mean by that is, they were only sold around 11,000 of these cars. If you had a twin turbo six speed, you were looking at 50, 55,000. Meanwhile, a Corvette at the time was 30 grand. Yeah, massive difference in price. Um, and at the time, Toyota wasn't this company like, oh, like it is today. Like, man, the cars were so reliable. They were reliable, but they weren't known for making these crazy sports cars. So back in the day in the US, you were buying a Corvette over this. Now that same Corvette is worth absolutely nothing. And these cars are selling well over a hundred grand. So who made the right decision? Um, but they only made a few of these. Uh, they made a total, and this is turbo, non-turbo, um, automatics, manuals, etc. Uh, it was 11,000 these cars made in the US and well, brought here. Uh, worldwide, I think there was 40 some thousand sold worldwide from 1993 and a half to 2002 which is, to put in perspective, just the R32 GTR, not the GTST, nothing, and just the R32, we're not counting R33s and 34s, they sold 40 some thousand of those just in GTRs. Just to put in perspective how rare these cars are. Um, they didn't sell nearly as much, the GTR just outsold them like crazy. Now, let's be honest, GTR actually had a better platform at the time. Now, going through it, these cars are 10 times better built. If you've ever been inside an R32 versus a Mark IV, it's two different cars. Um, yeah, even R33, R34 is pretty close to it, but these cars are overbuilt to another, just to another dimension. They're amazing. So guys, that's my opinion on the Mark IV Super versus Mark V. In my opinion, I feel like these cars are going to keep going up in price and keep going further and further, especially with the Mark V alone, just the launch editions. And that's not including all the other ones. They're gonna be sold 1,500, which are already sold out for the US. 1500 launch editions. Now that's not including all the base models, mid models yet. They'll probably sell five or 6,000 just this first year. And again, they only sold 11,000 total of these uh, throughout the entire time they're sold here in the US. I'm gonna say once it's all said and done with this body style, they'll probably end up selling 45, 50,000 of those cars. So the rarity warrants right there off the bat is just not going to be there. The fact that it does have a lot of BMW parts in it, I feel like is going to hinder some. As much as I love the car, just trying to be factual here and understanding of where the market's going to look at it at. But I wanna know down, the below, guy, down below, guys, what do you think? Like, is it going to hold its value? Is it going to drop in value? Is the right-hand drive market going to, to shove these down? Um, what do you guys think? Let me know down in the comments below. All right, guys, thank you very much for tuning in today. As you guys saw, I'm waiting on the turbo kit still. Uh, I've got about a week left till it gets here. Uh, we got a couple more things we need to do to the MR2 yet till we finish up this project. Uh, we're gonna go to a top mount single on this. Keep the 3SGT, it is a Gen 3 3SGT. So if you're an MR2 person, you're into MR2s, uh, stay tuned for this. Once we finish that up, we're going directly over to this car. And then we gotta find another project yet, which I'm still thinking about buying that black six speed super as a cool like restoration project. If you guys would like to see that, give this as many likes as you can so I can uh, push for that video. I need to know, I don't know unless you guys give me feedback. All right guys, thank you very much for tuning in today. Do me a favor, go check out the Facebook and Instagram, posting stuff way ahead of time there. Thank you guys very much and uh, I'll talk to you later. Peace.